Hi, welcome to the small shed. This week I'm going to start talking about how I built the shed and that's coming up next. Now I want to run through over the next few weeks how I built the shed. Um, it's a little bit difficult in that unfortunately I didn't decide to do any videoing of what I was doing until after I'd built the shed. Uh, but I did take an awful lot of still photographs at the time so there is a record there that I can uh, insert photographs of and I've built one or two mock-ups of wall panels and things so that I can demonstrate some of the stuff. Um, so apologies for that, it's just one of those things that the whole YouTube thing has evolved after the shed was finished almost. Um, I'm going to run through how I did it. It isn't necessarily an instruction as to how everybody should do it. This is just how I built it. Anybody who wants to make comments about you should have done it differently, it's a bit late now, it's built and I'm not going to knock it down and start again but obviously there are lots of different ways to do things. Um, just as a bit of a background, there are some credentials I think I have that give me a little bit of a start on this. Um, I've spent probably 35 years or so in construction around timber frame housing. So therefore things like vapour barriers and breather membranes and things like that are all stuff that I've dealt with in the past I know pretty well what they do and therefore I could apply those principles um, to how I built the shed. Similarly the timber frame housing I used to work on would arrive on the back of a lorry and we used to reckon I think within three or four days the roof would be on and again I wanted that sort of build that I could build the panels inside in the warm in the dry that gives you a lot more control over um, sizes and humidity and things like that because you're doing it almost in a factory build um, whereas doing it in the pouring rain you tend to just cut corners and want to get in the dry um, and that was I think broadly achieved so I want to talk today firstly about how I designed the shed why what all the parameters were um, and I'll run through that then next week or so we'll go through how the walls were constructed and why, what all the various components are for in the walls. Um, I want to do one on foundations and the floor because I've done it slightly differently to the way many people would normally do it. Um, again for probably good reasons but not necessarily the right reasons. And then I'll run on with a session on the roof and I'll probably then cover windows, doors and things like that in amongst that as well just as what I've done with those. So let's start off with the actual design of the shed itself and why I needed it. What I'd got originally was a traditional um, a six foot by eight foot shed door in the middle that opened, I'm trying to remember now, outwards, which is something. Um, but I'd put two layers of, two rows of benches, of uh, workbench either side of the entrance. Um, now that was a probably less than two foot wide either side, so first of all they weren't deep enough that way. Secondly, I'd put a chop saw in the middle there, which was fine if you wanted to cut an eight foot piece of timber in half. And in fact, it would have to be a seven foot six piece of timber in half because the eight foot is the outside dimension of the shed. Um, and to do anything in there as well, you had to get rid of the lawnmower, which sat there. And they're all garden tools in that corner, uh, rakes and things like that. So all in all there really wasn't a lot of room 
uh, it was wet or damp, it was cold and it wasn't big enough. Now I've ended up with on not quite the same footprint but it's pretty much in the same position a shed which is externally eight foot there and it's about nine ten foot there I think roughly um, overall with the door in the middle which again opens out that way I've deliberately put everything on either casters or wheels or mobile benches which at the moment is the MFT table I've moved the router table recently to there I've got the vacuum in the corner um, and I've got storage cart there which has got the band saw and um, chop saw which I'm making a chop saw station and a drill press and I've got a planar thickness of here on the cart but, and it may not seem a lot bigger but it's internally it's just over 50% bigger than the old one um, and you know I'll take that it, the only problem I've got with the shed now is that it's not big enough and I think however big I built the shed I think I'd still be saying it's not big enough you have to just cut your cloth to fit and one of the other problems I had with the old shed was that it was beginning to suffer damage um, got some photographs of what was happening there and they give an indication as well as to where the weak points are in any shed and perhaps most of the attention needs to be paid in those areas to prevent further problems. Um, firstly the underneath of the shed the support battens for the floor I'd put them on a damp proof course um, but unfortunately even then the ones at the outside edges had just crumbled away to nothing and I think one of the other problems is that if you put it on a damp proof course water can then get in around the sides of the shed if you get a lot of rainfall and it will then run along the damp proof course on top of it between the damp proof course and the actual battens so that in itself will cause rot particularly on the ends of the uh, support timbers so in this instance when I've rebuilt the shed the whole of the foundation timbers have been wrapped in fairly heavy duty polythene completely so that there's no way that water is going to get in there at all um, so that was one of the lessons to be learned um, the other thing is the bottom of the cladding has been damaged quite badly in places and that is generally because you don't have enough roof overhang you don't put gutters on perhaps on your shed and in my instance um, here it was because it was bouncing rain was bouncing up off the paving alongside it and that splashes back up and wets the bottom of the cladding hopefully I've, again I've got rid of most of that problem uh, the cladding is a little bit higher off the ground uh, I've put a much bigger overhang on the roof and in this instance now I've put rainwater gutters and collected the water into a water butt now here's a classic example of one of the problems I've got damp in the shed I've got rid of most of it but the sliding arms on the DeWalt chop saw that was in there have all got rust pitting on them that's the blades off the saws. That's just by being left in there. It wasn't leaking, it was just condensation. You can see where the paper protected it. So just water gathering on that surface has not ruined, but it was causing damage to pretty much anything in the shed. So that was one of the big problems. Um, the other problem was the stuff inside the shed. I've got a lawnmower rakes, garden rakes, hose, shovels, forks and they were all taking up a lot of room so in addition to 50% more inside the shed I've managed to get the all the equipment from the shed the gardening stuff, the lawn mower has all gone outside so that's given me a bit more room inside the shed effectively as well 
and I've also tucked away at the top um, the compressor so any air I want within the shed I'm not actually taking up any space with that either so these are all things that have come out of the old shed so it's more than 50% gain in, in room effectively Now all these decisions that were being made at the time were based on guesswork pretty much. Um, I didn't know quite where I wanted doors, I didn't quite know where I wanted windows. Um, so I had to provide some sort of solution that would be flexible enough to cope with that. Um, and that was partly dictated by uh, a number of things, um, the most important of which was the one was the desire to build it inside. Um, I could have cleared out the garage a bit more, but um, I could have built it under the carport at the front. There's a, about a, an eight or nine foot length of overhang that I could build it under. But I found um, a local men in sheds down in Bromsgrove quite by accident. I hadn't been looking to, to go and have a look at what they did anyway. And they seemed to provide the ideal solution. They got a a factory unit down there that I could go and build inside in the warm um, and bring the stuff home when I built it and although I could have put stuff on the roof rack I've principally ended up by designing the shed around the inside of the uh, the estate car I've got uh, in that the panels were built to a maximum 1.85 high and 950 mil wide because that was the space behind the driver's seat so that sort of dictated the design and it's again it's proved to be about right um, 1.85 high plus a couple of wall plates that have gone on afterwards give me plenty of headroom in here which was something the old shed never used to have uh, it gives me a doorway I can get through without skinning my head every time I walked in which the old shed used to um, and building my own panels like that it meant I could just effectively prefabricate everything off-site, stack them up at home and then they were all bolted together in a matter of two or three days to get the roof on and the place was then watertight um, in a matter of days rather than having to try and struggle. As it happened it was um, April, I think I was building it February, March, April uh, and at one stage I've got the temporary covering on the roof because I hadn't finally sorted out the roof sheets and there are pictures of it with snow on the polythene that I've got on top. So it was just as well I did it the way I did in that it meant that I could take advantage of a couple of decent days of weather we had, get the shed up, put a temporary roof on it and then I could carry on inside and, and do stuff until the weather picked up then. So that again worked out well. Now as the bits gathered that uh, I was buying off eBay and going and collecting from here, there and everywhere. Uh, that started to dictate one or two things that became standards um, throughout the build. The half height of the intermediate rail was pretty much fixed early on and that enabled me to get windows that would be of the right size to fit in the shed. Uh, and the final consideration that anybody's got to have with something like this um, has to be budget. I mean, there wasn't unlimited funds. It wasn't so much the fact that I had to have a budget to work to because I couldn't afford to do this, that or the other. It was the, the discipline of having a budget at the first place stops you running away with stupid ideas. Um, I priced out pretty much everything that I thought we had uh, that we needed in the shed. The cladding was the biggest cost I think. Uh, the timbers that I used for the uprights are CLS timbers so I knew roughly what they would be and how many I'd want. Um, but things like the roofing were totally unknown and it's very easy with this sort of thing to, to get to the point where you need a roof. You see something that you think would be the answer and you go out and buy it. And before you know where you are you spent four or five hundred pounds on insulated roof panels because they're the right thing to have when if you'd set a budget at the start you knew you'd only got I think I'd put £200 in for the roof and somehow or other I had to make that work and by a, a, a sequence of 
perhaps good luck, but also a lot of hard work looking on local uh, Facebook pages and eBay. I found two seven meter long olive green, which happened to be exactly the colour I wanted, um, insulated roof panels down in Gloucester for £140. And so I went down there and I came home with six panels stacked on top of one another on the roof of the car, which was nearly as tall as the car itself. Um, but that's the way we got round it. Same with the windows. A, a decent window is probably two or three hundred pounds and to get the sizes that I wanted um, it would have probably then cost £900, something like that. But again it was persistence. I found somebody selling aluminium double glazed units that were second hand out of a care home or something they were demolishing and I think I ended up down, I think I ended up in Worthing for those, picking them up and again it's probably cost me £50 in petrol and a day's discomfort running up and down the motorways in the rain but we got them and they are brilliant windows that would probably have cost two or three thousand pounds if I'd gone out and bought them new um, but again they were brought in for 250 pounds so it's a matter of just setting that budget in the first place and then trying to work to it it doesn't matter what the budget is the chances are there's a way around it one way or the other if, if I hadn't had enough money for the cladding I would have had to have gone for something like pallet wood on the outside or just maybe on the back elevation I could have got away with exterior quality plywood or something like that. There are ways around these things if you buy second hand um, shuttering ply things like that. As long as you've set that budget in the first place it gives you a target to aim for and we came in I think I allowed a 10% contingency I think I came in about 30 or 40 pounds over that on couple of thousand pounds spend. It wasn't cheap but it was what I wanted and it's proved again it, it's more of a shed more than a shed it's a, a garden room effective. So that's it really the if you're going to build a shed yourself my only advice therefore would be uh, firstly spend a lot of time thinking about it um, decide where it's going to go get a rough idea of what doors and windows you want to put in it. There is a very good argument for not having any windows at all from a security point of view but I like to look out and see the birds and see a little bit of sunshine every now and again but there is an argument not to have windows at all. Um, so decide where it's going to go, decide where your windows and doors are going to go, set yourself a budget that's realistic, think it through, look at what's available um, and off you go from there. There are other options. Um, I wanted something that was substantial and that would take insulation in the walls so therefore the, the whole design was based around a 63mm stud. You can buy sheds off the peg which have got a lot cheaper smaller timbers in the walls and you can work from them. Again I didn't want to do that, I didn't want to buy a shed, I wanted to build one. Uh, it's part of the the whole point of whatever anything I do I think. I'm not really that interested in buying stuff just for the sake of it. Um, I prefer to make things. And at the time I didn't even know what I was going to do in here. I just wanted a, a space in which to work. It could have easily been that I reawakened the interest in the two cars, one in the garage and one on the drive that need work doing on them. So it could be that I was taking engines apart in here. Um, it could have been that I'd carried on with my railways and built a model railway in here. The room itself is sufficiently well designed and heated and insulated that it can do more or less anything now. So it's worth thinking about what you want to do in there and then designing around that as well. So hopefully that may have been of some use. Sorry it's been a bit talky because I just haven't got the video footage of anything that was going on at that stage but um, I hope it's of interest if it is I'll start and talk about the design of the walls next week and how we get rid of the problems with condensation and uh, moisture in, in, the, in the shed itself. I'll see you then. Bye! Mm -hmm.